Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. For their operating system. They yeah, but it. you're always going to have people out there, uh, different people. You're going to have people who want to build their own cars, and you're going to have people who just care that the steering wheel and radio dial work. And as far as yeah. cars are concerned, I, that's that's me. I mean, yeah, sure, I'm interested in learning a little bit more, a bit at a time, you know, knowing enough to be dangerous. And in many ways, I approach computers the same way. I've built my own computer, and I've purchased them off the shelf. And I can tell you, uh, nine times out of ten, I'm equally, I feel equally as happy uh, with either decision. And I realize nine, yeah. nine times out of ten, I haven't owned ten computers in my life, but generally speaking, having been, um, you know, on both sides, it's it's just the thrill of being able to build something on your own. In which case, we'll go down to Radio Shack and, and get a robotics kit, uh, or you know, have something prepackaged ready to go. And in terms of consumer operating systems, it, that's where I find OS 10 to just be. I mean, every time I turn around, there's just something else that is just so impressive. Uh, whether it's the software development community uh, or the way yeah. that uh, is software is, is just handled in general uh, inside of OS X shell. It's the power of Unix, I mean, not completely and utterly, but I think it's about as close as the average person's ever going to get to the power of or Unix. Or want to get. Or want to get, truthfully. But I do see a big change coming because with the increasing popularity of Apple, you're going to see more and more applications that will be cross-platform or yep. just be available to the Mac. And it will make it that much easier for people to switch to the Mac, and it's just going to drive the, you know, they've solved the chicken and the egg problem finally. Yep. Well, and they, they've had that for quite some time. It's just I think Leopard's going to put a finer point on it. I had a an update for Colloquy, which of course is the program that runs the chat in the video. It's just basically a live yeah. screen grab of that. Uh, there was an update that was just released and when you launch Colloquy it checks and it'll tell you there's a there's actually a program and I, I'll have to look up the name of the program if you guys know what it is it's a program library that any application developer can use so Colloquy uses this library that essentially essentially lets it check for updates it tells me hey there's an update available but then it shows me the change log it said in this version all these things have changed click here to update oh click I update it it runs through it, and then it's it. You, you say, do you, you know? Do you want to close and restart? Yeah, close and restart. You restart it. OS 10 on a different level will say, hey, the, some things have changed. Do you want to move your previous settings to this new location? And you go, uh, yeah. And then it works. More importantly, what I was even more impressed with. I've never. I don't think I've ever been more impressed. Well, I have been on Microsoft side. Um, very few times I've been impressed with program crashes because programs crash on any operating system. It's just it's just happens, right? It's the nature of the beast. Yeah. So Colloquy crashes the new version. I get prompted, "Do you want to send this report to Apple and Colloquy, not just Apple, the operating system, the, the 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 operating system team, but directly to the developer as well?" So what that means is that developer is going to get debug information to find out what needs to be fixed next. Genius. And I don't know if that was custom rolled by Colloquy or if it was a utility, a library that's bundled with the application that any app, uh, app developer can make. I was also, I can tell you, the only other time I was ever impressed with the program crash was with an early beta of Microsoft Office 2007. It crashed, and I had, in, in the system tray, I had a smiley face and a frowny face. And I could say, something happened. I don't like it. I clicked the frowny face. He says, what, what didn't you like? Well, I didn't like that it did this. So they got, the, the team got feedback. Well, at one point, it crashed. And I got this notification in that uh, beta utility that said, this bug has been fixed in the next revision. I was like, oh, dude, that was awesome. I mean, I, I, I did not mind at all because I knew the fix was coming. It was no longer, oh, the program I, crashed, I'm, I, I'm I hitting a dead end. I one of those in Windows with the Windows error reporting. Yeah. Some program that crashed, it's like, and just below it, it's like, click here to view the knowledge base article on how to fix this problem. And I was like, you mean this thing actually did something? But, but it pretty much proved the point that the reason why the Microsoft one doesn't offer to send the, the crash log to the developer is it's always Microsoft's fault. Well, that's not always the case either. But, you know, you're talking case, about you would rather roll your own operating system, but you're never, I don't think you're going to find that many 
similar types of experiences because I don't think Unix no. and Linux are geared toward the average user. It, despite as many advancements as I see him doing with Ubuntu and everything, you, you know, you're they're trying. But they're trying, it's so but it's not even long. close. You know, it's they're not even Linux isn't even remotely close. And I'm not saying that Vista is a better alternative, not by any stretch of the imagination. But in terms of usability and friendliness, I just don't think Linux has it. I just don't think their mind is, is right there on the desktop. It, it's just not. Desktop performance is not priority one. No. Also, they need to standardize their, their package manager. Yeah, that's for sure. Because yeah, they, well, it's but too much. That's something that the whole group of BSDs, because there's actually like six different versions of BSD. There's FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, Dragonfly BSD, PC BSD, et cetera. And they all use, there's two different package managers between the six of them. But yeah, so it's, there's no reason why the package management systems on all Linuxes can't be based on the same system. It would be a lot less work for them. But you know, that's like the nature. Again, you customize per operating system or whatever. Instead see, of having to but here's the thing. That's what makes open source so wonderful is that you can have a million different ideas, but it's also its biggest pain point. And, yeah, and well, this is where, like, they did a study on comparing BSD to Linux, and they found that on average, BSD developers are 10 years older than Linux developers. <laughs> really? Yes, the median age is in the 30s and not, you know, the early 20s. So now, in layman's terms, give uh, the uh, just broad differences between free. BSD's license and its whole schema versus Linux, because most people don't ever hear about free BSD. I have a clue at all, right. right. Well, Linux uses the GNU public license agreement, which is this ginormous legal document explaining all the things you can and can't do and how it all works. The free BSD license is two sentences. <laughs> you can't remove the copyright and you must reproduce the copyright, and that's it. That's the entire license. That's pretty simple. And of course, uh, yes. OS X is based on a mock kernel, like an er an earlier one. Right. Although they have, haven't they also, hasn't Apple also been contributing code back to FreeBSD, the, the kernel? Somewhat, a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't say to an extreme well, degree, obviously. They, they started the Darwin project, which took right. parts of BSD and then built their own kernel, and that's what became the base of OS X. And then Darwin kind of continues, and they contribute some code back. And it's complicated because of the licensing, but mostly it's the FreeBSD license allows companies like Apple to take without having to give back. That's why but Apple see, probably chose FreeBSD over right. Linux because anything they develop that they consider proprietary, they don't have to give back. It's not a requirement, right? Like it is with Linux. Well, I, I wouldn't just say that that's the reason why they chose it. Unix was around for how many years? Exactly. Yeah, that, you know, compared really to Linux. Another major difference between FreeBSD and Linux is FreeBSD is based on the original Unix, and it's always been developed by engineers and right. using sound engineering principles. And like the number of people that can contribute directly to the Linux kernel is like five. For the FreeBSD kernel, it's like six hundred. Six hundred. Yes. Wow. But there's a, there's a whole like management system. Nobody can contribute directly until they've first been selected and then they have to go under, undergo like two years of mentoring from somebody who is already a full contributor. Wow. So people can't just go in there and change stuff willy nilly. So here's the question, why isn't Microsoft I investing in a, a free BSD derivation? I and mean, who's to say they haven't already? Well, they well, should, they should go that route. The, the, the uh, TCP IP stack in Windows 95 was taken from FreeBSD, or from BSD in general. Wow, that I didn't know. Because the BSD license allows you to take stuff and use it, and all you have to do is leave the copyright. Huh. Interesting. What people don't know and what they don't care to know, and what they'll probably never know. Yep.